pray these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, third service. Good morning. Look in the aisles. Coming your way are youth from our junior high, senior high, and college ministries that are going out on spring break on a missions trip, and that's grounds for an applause. They're taking it to the street. Thank you. I love this particular tradition of Creekside, and as uh, we've got about 70 plus people that are going out on mission trips this. Uh, this next week, let me just share with you a little bit what they're gonna do. We've got 24 students from junior high that are going to inner city of San Francisco to partner with City Service Mission. They're gonna meet physical and spiritual needs of the homeless, help in a vacation Bible school, serve food and donations at different shelters, and intentionally seek to understand the realities of those who live in the city. That's junior hires, man, junior high. I couldn't even find my nose to pick it. And these junior hires are committed to that. That's awesome. That was not scripted, but whatever. Uh, high school, we have 38 students going to inner city Sacramento. They've actually been preparing their hearts as they've, as they've taken a look at their own realities compared to the realities of the kind of lifestyle of people they're going to serve, which is a great way to prep this. They're going to expose themselves to local mission opportunities. They're going to be interacting with the homeless serving with Union Gospel Mission, Elk Grove Food Bank, Class Slipper, and Shriners Children's Hospital. I got some kind of a buzz loop here in the stage. They're gonna help with some Creekside projects as well, and they're gonna be engaged in prayer for the community during this coming week. And then 10 college students that are also going to inner city Sacramento. They're gonna overnight here at Creekside, but they're gonna be exposed to local community mission outreach opportunities, like homeless outreach, serving at the food bank, and they're gonna be working on some spiritual disciplines as well. So I know you guys have lived through this two times, one more time, and then I'm done, okay? Uh, first of all, I wanna say on behalf of the church, there's a lot of people here that have never done what you're about to do, so we're proud of you, and we thank you for going out for it. Yeah. And you know what I'm gonna say next, but that other people at the service don't. Uh, this is a perfect illustration of what we're going to talk about this morning, which is Jesus hanging out with people that were far from God. And uh, my charge to you for the third time this morning is whenever your internal instincts want to default to fear and moving away from people that are dissimilar to you, let faith conquer fear and walk towards these people and, and do what Jesus would do. And, uh, and then I invite you to be surprised when you just connect faith and engage in friendship and conversation. We'll see what God does. But uh, that's what Jesus would do. I encourage you to do that. Now, church, if you're close enough and the people don't freak out, you might want to lay hands on them or at least stretch your hands out to them because we're going to pray a commissioning prayer for these folks that go out. This is a beautiful thing we do here at Creekside, okay? All right. If they say you're touching me too much, then, uh, you know, <laughs> to back off, right? All right. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for these junior high, senior high, and college students. And in this moment of prayer, God, I want each of these students to feel the acceptance and the encouragement that we are sending their way as they go out. God, thank you for these people. We would pray, Lord, obviously for their safety, but more importantly, that the life of Christ be formed in them and that faith would conquer fear, that you'd help them to make some really cool spiritual discoveries this week, and that you'd bring fruit from this experience, Lord, that somehow a human-to-human -human touch based on faith would bring the living God into the world of people that they're going to minister to. We so much want to be salt and light in this world you've left us in. And so we commission these young people and pray, God, your best and beyond, and that they'd come back saying, listen to what God has done. So send them out in that spirit, Holy Spirit. Go before them, create opportunities for them. And, and Lord, we're just grateful for this moment and for these people that we can send out in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's have another applause for our folks that are going out on short term. 
mission trips. They perfectly illustrate what I'm going to talk about this morning. Now, I also want to say this is the last time we're going to talk about this. In 2019, uh, Creekside is going back to Israel for the third time, and we have a representative from Yala Tours that's going to be with us at 3 o'clock this afternoon. If you're interested, I understand there's some photocopies of this. Everybody's grabbed up all these brochures, but there's brochures out of the guest uh, service desk that explain what's going on. And if you want to know more or you're interested in seeing the Holy Land in 3D, uh, we're going to have a... We're going to have an information meeting at 3 o'clock in room A1, which is right behind our coffee, higher grounds area. And uh, boy, I just, I can't overstate what a powerful experience it is to experience the Holy Land and see where Jesus did what he did and where heaven and earth touched and kissed. So, so there, there you go. You got that? I also want to say, um, I don't do this very often because I don't feel like the pulpit is a place to do PR, but I want to send you to a movie this week. Uh, for a short period of time, I can only imagine is in the movie theaters. And uh, there's a lot of garbage that's come out uh, in movies lately, but this one's a stellar movie. Our whole life group's going this week to see this, and I just encourage you, whenever there's a faith film with that kind of content that, that speaks about a person's spiritual journey, you know the song, you know. You want me to sing it to you now? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Surrounded by your glory. Okay, anyways, go see I Can Only Imagine, and you won't be, you won't be disappointed, all right? Um, let me change directions. It was a few years ago, and my wife signed me up for a community college course without telling me ahead of time. <laughs> and, and she paid for it. And I'm such a skinflint, I had to go because she paid for it. And I thought, what are you doing? She said, yeah, you've lost your Great Commission edge. You're boring and two-dimensional now. She said, yeah, you're surrounded by Christians all the time. When we lived in Italy, we were always interacting with people far from God. That was our reality. And so we shared our faith naturally. It flowed across friendships. Very, very, it was a, a very easy thing. But now you're always surrounded by Christians. And I thought, she's right. I'm married to a Christian. I work all week long with Christians. I spend several nights a, me a week at meetings with Christians. I worship with Christians. I'm always with Christians. Now, don't take me. I like Christians. They're okay. But my wife said, you lost your Great Commission edge, buddy. You're boring. You, you got to get your mojo back. So go to the course. It's a, wait, it's a woodworking antique course at, on Thursday night. Yeah, but you're going to be surrounded by unchurched people. Go. You'll like it. Do I have a say in the matter? No. So I went. And she was right. It was fun, and I was surrounded by unchurched people. And I was able to kind of get some of my mojo back. But before you kind of blow this story off, let me ask you this. What are you doing to intentionally and aggressively pursue relationships with people that are far from God, that just kind of hang out with people that need God? Is any of that in your life? If you are a Christ follower this morning, that is your call. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you into the world. That's our call. We're called to be salt. We're called to be light. Salt has no, has no effect unless it's poured out. Light has no effect unless it's turned on. And so my question again is, what kind of contact do you have with people that are far from God? Do you intentionally pursue that? Some people, I had a lady talk to me after the second service. She said, I get that 24-7 because I'm even married to an unbeliever. So I live in the context of spiritual warfare, and I understand that. But for many of us, we don't. We kind of isolate, and I've talked with some people that are, they kind of proudly say, I don't have any, I only have Christian friends. And I, I go, well, I'm not so sure you should be proud of that. Because we're called to seek and to save the lost. And you can't do that if you don't have friends. So let me give you kind of a lead in principle before we dive into Luke chapter 5 and talk about the calling of Levi, okay? Um, you can't have impact without contact. You can't pretend that you're going to have some kind of a spiritual aroma in the lives of people if you don't even relate to them, if you don't have a relationship with them. And sometimes you have to really want this and seek it out. This last year we took, uh, Melissa, you were on, it was like 52 people we took to Israel in the month of October. And we would do debriefing sessions, you know, after various sites. 
And I remember that a common theme kept coming up as we revisited the stories and all the way the salvation drama played out in Israel. And one of the things that people kept saying was, Jesus was very, very serious about us getting the good news out. And a lot of people were saying, I need to make some serious corrections in my behavior to make that happen. So when we were going to Bethlehem, uh, there were a lot of hand-carved wooden Christmas ornaments. And so I gave everybody a homework assignment. I said, I want all of you to buy three, at least three hand-carved Christmas ornaments. And I want you to take them home with you and give them to your neighbors or friends or colleagues that don't know God. Can we give them to Christians? No. Be mean to Christians. I want you to, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But I want you to actually stretch yourself and, and just gift it to them and just tell them this is a hand-carved Christmas ornament from Bethlehem where Jesus was born. If a conversation occurs, fine. If it doesn't, fine. That was a homework assignment. And if they didn't do it, I charged them a fine or made them sing a solo in church. And they all did it, so no one sung a solo in church. So, But you understand, we had to intentionally want that. We had to pursue it. We had to do something to make it happen. Because a lot of believers live in a bubble. It's kind of an evangelical ghetto. I had, I had one person come up to me. It was like three months into being pastor here, okay? Um, and they said, I got a great idea. Let's do Christian yellow pages so that we only do business with Christians. And I said, um, no. No. Because you fail your mission. If you isolate yourself and you only deal with people that have a fish by their business title, besides the fact that it's kind of boring. Not that Christians are boring. You know what I mean. But you can't have impact if you don't have contact. You have to want it. You have to pursue it. When Jesus arrived on the scene, he shocked the religious establishment by his ongoing practice of aggressively pursuing people who had very little God in their lives. And that is precisely what we're going to find him doing when he calls Levi to become a disciple. Last week, if you were here with us, there was a paralyzed man that was lowered through a roof. Do you remember this, right? And Jesus forgave him of his sins before healing him of his paralysis, a double healing. Today, Jesus is gonna go after a hardcore sinner and not just forgive him of his sins, but to call him into the inner circle of his disciples and make him one of the pillars and foundation stones of a worldwide faith movement. Go figure. That's what he's going to do. Jesus, friend of sinners. Let's talk about the call of Levi, okay? Chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading at verse 27, okay? After this, that's after Jesus healed that paralyzed man and, and, and forgave his sins. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi uh, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up left everything, and followed him. Because you see the same thing in verse 11. When he called other disciples, they left everything and followed him. And here it is again. He left. This is a beautiful little story that exposes how Jesus made such strange and strategic decisions because he intentionally goes outside the lines, goes outside convention and expectations, and he calls a man into his service who others viewed as infinitely disqualified for service to God because of his sordid past. This guy was a sinner. Jesus called the man, and his name was Levi. You probably know him better as Matthew. Matthew is the author of the first gospel of the New Testament, and you would not have that if it were not for this passage here. And he was a tax collector. Some of your translations say he was a publican. Those are one and the same thing. That's not a Republican, that's a publican, okay? Uh, they're about the same, but they're different, okay? Um, so let me, give you, let me give you principle number two, okay? Principle number two is we think about the calling of Levi is that you've got to focus on the future potential of a person rather than on their past. That's exactly what we see Jesus doing in action here as he's hanging out with those who need God. Focus on the future potential and not on the past. I mean, it's hard for me to overstate how scandal is choosing to call Levi into discipleship would have been in those days. The occupation of a tax collector or a customs official was despised in his day. I mean, the other two Gospels that have this story, Matthew and Mark, they don't even mention the name of his job. It's so scandalous. It's considered a foul word. Publican. Tax collector. They even avoid the Only Luke actually tells us head on what it is. Here's a guy that collects taxes. He exacts custom tariffs from people. Let me give you a little background. 
Mark tells us this story happened in Capernaum, and that's Jesus' ministry headquarters in Galilee, and it's a perfectly strategic place because of all the people coming and going, all the merchandise that's moving across the various trade routes. You got people who need God always coming and going out of Capernaum, okay? It was on the road that led out into Asia and Damascus. It led over to the coast, over to Ptolemais and a port city. It led north-south to Jericho and Jerusalem. I mean, people were always coming and going at this crossroads. And Capernaum was a port of call. Even the fish traffic and the merchandise that moved across the water, the Romans said, hey, this is like the goose that laid the golden egg. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a tax assessor's office right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and people coming and going on land are or people coming and going by sea, it doesn't matter. We're going to charge import and export duties on every piece of merchandise that's moving through the place. And here's where it gets juicy. Because local tax collectors were Jewish, but they worked for the Romans, who were considered pagan overlords, and people hated the Romans. But they hated the tax collectors because they were double traders who worked for the Romans against their own people. Let me explain how. The job of a tax collector is a bit of a mystery unless you know a little bit of culture here. What the Romans did was they had tax collectors all over the Roman Empire to get money, okay? So what they did was they sold these jobs to the highest bidder. And people would pay a certain price every single year to do this job. And the Romans didn't want records. They didn't want all these receipts. They just said, give us this much money. We think you can get that much money. And anything above that amount of money that you can get, and by the way, we'll give you soldiers to help you extort money and to gouge people for anything you get above that, you can put it in your pocket. No integrity required. So they lied and cheated and ripped off their fellow Jews working for Roman overlords. They were worse than the Romans. Levi wasn't a sinner. He was an outrageous sinner. He never went to the synagogue. Nobody ever wanted to hang out with this guy. And knowing all this, Jesus still called him into his inner circle. And by the way, God never says, oops. He did it on purpose. <laughs> he not only is going to be a disciple, he calls Levi to become one of his closest friends and one of the 12 foundation stones upon which he would build a worldwide faith movement. Jesus is scandalous here. Jesus must have had some really important reason to call a tax collector into the circle, into a circle, because he's going he's gonna to face some violent criticism. Remember, in the last episode we read in Luke where Jesus heals a paralyzed man, sin police or Pharisees from all over Israel, Judea, and Galilee had descended on Capernaum to spy on Jesus. And right after he heals that paralyzed guy and forgives his sin, he calls Levi right under their noses. They all see it. They're going to jump on him and criticize him for going out of bounds. And he did it anyways. It was costly, dearly costly for him to call Levi. Why would he do it? I had a conversation with some people this week about that. And it was interesting because, um, and, I, and it just goes to serves to underline this principle we already shared with you, that we, it's not a new thing, you don't have to write new words, but uh, you focus on the future potential of people and not on their past. Think with me for just a second. If we could just kind of, can we just push the, the past button of Levi that's full of bad stuff? Can we just put a pause on that for a second and then think about this guy, this man before Jesus, okay? Who was Levi? Levi was intelligent. Levi was calculating. Levi was very accurate. He was a good record keeper. He knew how to network with powerful people. He wasn't afraid to deal with difficult situations. And he knew how to take rejection. That sounds like characteristics that would serve him well in the ministry. Jesus saw it. He looked at his future potential rather than his sordid past. And he called him. I mean, if the Holy Spirit could just get a hold of this guy's life, he could go from writing pornography to writing a gospel. The skill was there. It just needed to be harnessed and redirected. But it was there. I mean, it's our flesh. It's 
the world system that teaches us to fear certain people. It's even the devil himself that wants to cause us to socially kind of reject and ostracize certain people as out of bounds for God. But the Holy Spirit would say, no, they're made in the image of God. Go after them. Go after them. See what can happen under the transforming influence of Jesus Christ. Don't forget, Abraham was a liar. Joseph was a selfish brat. Jeremiah was a crybaby. David was an adulterer. Moses and Paul were murderers. Peter was a denier and a hypocrite. Levi was a fraudulent thief and national traitor. But God saw their potential and he called them into his service. Jesus said, you, come follow me. And shock of all shocks, Levi stood up, left everything, and followed him. And don't think for a second this is the first time Levi's met Jesus. Some people read this and go, he'd never met Jesus before, and then he just left everything and followed him. No, it doesn't play out that way. Jesus has been doing miracles at Capernaum. Uh, Levi has heard him speak on the periphery of crowds. Levi was drawn to this man. There was something so different about Jesus that was unlike the religious elite of his day. They shut the door on Levi. Jesus rolled out the welcome mat to Levi. That's a big difference. And that leads to principle number three. When it came to Levi looking at Jesus, people know when you really care about them. They know it. Levi was no dummy. He was kind of a wicked guy, but he wasn't dumb. I know that there's kind of artificial and cultural barriers that we've formed between us and people that are far from God. I, I know that Christians can do that. But I gotta say that loving concern can build bridges where only walls and roadblocks existed before. There's an old song that sings that love will build a bridge. I don't know if you know that song. And Levi, uh, when he encountered Jesus, you got to understand the tax collectors, when they met people like Pharisees, the Pharisees wanted them to rot in hell. They were too far gone. They were beyond the reach of the grace of God. So they wrote him off. And when he saw Jesus and interacted with Jesus, and, and, and just saw his eyes and his demeanor, he experienced something that he'd never experienced before, which was that the door to God is still open. It's not closed. It's not too late. And I think God had been working on this man's heart for a long time, but even if he wanted to make his way back to God, the religious leaders of the day had shut the door in his face. There was no way back. He was too far gone. I want you, I'm just going to show you the scripture, but I, I really want you to learn this one too. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 8 is a, is a spectacular verse because it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. That's what Jesus did. He didn't, he didn't you know, sweep it under the rug so you trip over it, but Jesus didn't focus on the past misdeeds. He focused on the future potential. Can we read these words together? You ready? Above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. Given my experience in dealing with a lot of people, both inside and outside the church, I would venture to say that there's a number of people in your orbit of friendships, even now, that are being drawn by the power of Jesus Christ. And you will never know it if you don't engage them in friendly communication. You'll never know it and miss an opportunity. People know when you really care about them. I know there's this old trite saying, and you've heard it a bunch of times. Forgive me, but I'm going to give it to you again. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You can hold another in-depth Bible study where you do information transfer, but if you don't love people, they're probably not interested. Because life transformation doesn't just come with information transfer. It comes with life transfer. And there was just something about Jesus that told Levi that he was welcome. He knew where he wasn't welcome. You can bet Levi never went to the synagogue. But with Jesus, the welcome mat was rolled out. There was just something compelling about Jesus. So I, I got to stop right here and say something. In any given church service here at Creekside Christian Church, you might be new here, so let me just say this. There's people all over the board spiritually in all different phases of discovery and growth, okay? And that it's always true that in any given service, there's some people that are brand new and they're just checking this whole thing out. Jesus, following Jesus, what might that look like? 
And I just want you to know, we at Creekside are thrilled that you're here. You matter to God, so you matter to us. And, and we, we want you to feel safe here to explore. Because quite frankly, if I could reduce Jesus' demeanor down to a word, he was approachable. He was approachable, even though he was a man of God. There was something about him that made people feel welcome in his presence. He was also safe. I don't, you know, he's a lion, so I mean, how safe is a lion? But there was just something about him where they could just sort of blah, put it all out there. And he wasn't going to condemn them. He was going to give them a way forward. And I just hope that that's what you want to be. That's what Jesus is. That's what he calls us to be. And the ra rather startling fact in this story is he fixes his gaze on Levi saw the potential in his life, called him into service, and verse 28 says, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. It's a classic and rather drastic departure from his old way of life, but Levi knew that it was a God moment. The door was open. He'd never seen an open door like that before, and he seized it, and he walked away from his lifestyle, and he never turned back. And as a result, God changed this man, and he gives us one of the most spectacular gospels in the Bible. Look what your God can do if you just give him a chance. This week I had somebody come into my office who was dealing with a really, 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 really hard issue. And in the middle of our conversation, it, it became obvious that this person was sympathetic to Christ but had not made a decision to follow Christ yet. And I had the thrill of actually introducing this person to becoming born again with Christ in my office. And I got to say, I don't think that should be the anomaly. I think that should be what we learn to do by nature. And it was so natural, that whole conversation, because God was just drawing this woman. So her receiving Christ and stepping into his family was like taking the next breath of oxygen. It just made sense. And now she has the power to deal with a problem that she's not been able to deal with very well before. What a thrill. Let me, let me give you another principle here, folks. Principle number four is, is that you would be surprised at all the people who would respond to God if you simply built a bridge of true concern into their lives. I know that's a long principle, so let me read it again, okay? You would be surprised at all the people who would respond to God if you simply built a bridge of true concern into their lives. But you got to try. I know I have. And i got to say also, along the way, uh, there are people that, I've, that I'm speaking with that I'm thinking, oh, they're going to become a Christian right away. They're just, I mean, they're just, and, and they don't always. And then I also am dealing with people that are thinking, oh, that's a lost cause. And then I find out later they've, come, they've become a Christian. You know, I'm going, well, go figure. There's just a lot I don't know here. But i got to tell you, one of the things that that teaches me is build a bunch of bridges at the same time. Because you don't ever know who's going to respond to the love and power of Christ. So just be a bridge builder. Build a lot of bridges, right? Now i got to tell you, side note. Side note. First of all, I, I want to say, how many of you think I go this way to the pulpit more than that way to the pulpit? You think I go more over here? You do? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. This is for you, darling. This is one of the coolest touches in this story, and you probably didn't even see it. Remember when Jesus calls Simon into ministry? He gives him a new name. He calls him Peter which means rock. He changed his life. You're going to be a rock for God. And he does the same thing here. He says, Levi, from here on out, history's going to know you by a different name. You're going to be called Matthew. And you think so? Do you know what Matthew means? Matthew means gift of God. When was the last time Levi ever looked him in the face and said, you are a gift of God. No one. They called him the son of the devil. They hated him. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. no. You are going to be a gift of God to the whole human race. Now, I, if that doesn't show you something about Christ and how he operates, I, 
I, that illustration is just so strong to me as I think about how Jesus repurposes people and even gives them a new name. The Bible tells us in Revelation he's going to give all of us a new name. It's awesome, man. All right, well, i got to keep going because I'm getting excited, but I'm hungry. Okay, so listen, um, the next thing, well, I'm, it's good that both of us are hungry. Wherever you're going, if you pay, I'm going. Okay, um, so he throws a party. I mean, he's, he's, I'm leaving my lifestyle. I'm going to have a going away party, verse 29. Then Levi had a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. You can bet this is not the crowd that goes to the synagogue here, Okay. This is a stroke of genius on Levi's part. Before he walks away from his network of friends, he simply wants to spend some, he wants them to meet Jesus, become, get closer to Jesus, because he knows when you meet Jesus, things change. He's the heart melter. He's like the heart magnet. There's no hidden agenda here. He tells his friends who had no access to religious people, you gotta come and meet this guy. We're just gonna have a party. At the party, do you think there was music? He's, he, do you think there was food? Oh my. Matthew was wealthy because he ripped people off. This is the best Jesus ever ate. Do you think there was laughter? Oh yeah. And they packed in like sardines. Do you think people touched Jesus? Do you think Jesus enjoyed himself? I know that freaks some people out. But be freaked out. Levi had lots of money. Jesus was obviously accessible. He throws a huge party. This is his first missionary effort. It was a great one. It was a great idea. It's, this, it's a big deal, by the way, when you use your home, too. Uh, we have like 70 life groups in our church. Uh, something like that. 70-something. Is that about right? Okay. Uh, 70, and, and, and so most of these people have hosts that actually open their home on a weekly basis for people to come into their home and walk on their carpet and open their refrigerator and stuff like that. But the, it's their sacred space and they actually open it up for the purposes of God and spiritual development. Let me just take my hat off to you life group hosts and say thank you in the name of God for making your sacred space available to our people. Thank you. And that's what Levi's doing here too. He's just opening his home and it's packed with all these people that are stepping on his carpet and eating his food. He doesn't care he's wealthy and his tax collector. This is not just synagogue crowd people, okay? There was probably some prostitutes there as well. This is, this is, a, this is a, an interesting crowd, all right? You know, every believer has a network of friends that we have influence with and we're not talking about a trick or a gimmick here, folks. Heaven and hell are real, and I think we need to kind of test the waters with people, and I think we need to help people get an exposure to Jesus Christ. It's just sort of like letting the lion out of the cage. The lion does all the work after that, man. But i got to tell you, I have never had anything in my life make greater contributions to me than when Clark and Jeff and Kim introduced me to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll be forever grateful. I will never be able to pay them back for that. The problem is that, and this really kills me, is, is that if Levi, after years of being a tax collector, wanted to make his way back to God, it, the road was always closed. There was no way back until Jesus. It made all the difference in the world. I've shared this with you before and I'll share it with you again because I think this is very helpful for us to understand that there are possible attitudes towards the loss and some people think, don't use such an offensive term loss, why do you use that? I just use that term because Jesus used that term. Jesus calls people that don't yet know God in a personal way lost, okay? So let me just say that there are people that they might be sympathetic to God but they don't know him personally. Jesus either puts people in a lost and found category. So I'm, I'll let Jesus defend himself on that one, okay? But attitude number one is that we can just despise and avoid people that are far from God. Just write them off. You don't like them. You hate them. You avoid them. Uh, and by the way, this is what the religious, religious establishment did in Jesus' day. Let them burn in hell. They made mistakes. Let them pay for it, okay? The second possible attitude is to view them with indifference. This is not hatred. This is not avoidance. This is just simply... Uh, I don't care. 
there's no empathy for them. They see them kind of as like bushes or trees or cars or just inanimate objects. They just don't care. They won't change or adjust their lifestyle to try to help these people. The third category would be to receive them when they draw near. And this is what Jesus was accused of, being a friend of sinners. And this would be when uh, people meet you at the water cooler at work because they know you're a Christian and they ask you a faith question. They're approaching you. That's great. That's great. Or they come to church of their own volition. That's great. And, and, and we want to receive them when they come. But Jesus was actually guilty of a much more heinous crime. The fourth possible attitude is to actively seek people that are far from God. That is what Jesus was actually guilty of actually seeking them out. You see, the guests that were present at this party were from Levi's same social and moral status. Persons who rightly or wrongly were considered as gross offenders of the law of God. And I got to tell you people, and it looks, I, let me just address an invisible ele elephant, okay? And I always go this way, right? So I'll go this way again. I, I'm telling you I love you, okay? He, this is... One of the reasons we don't engage in trying to share our faith is fear, but there's another, there's another reason too, fear of contamination, okay? Because uh, we know what our old lifestyle was like and we don't wanna go back to it. And if we go out and hang out with those people, we might go back to that lifestyle. I think the secret balance is to abide in Christ and a growing relationship with Christ and continually risk and engage. But some people would say, no, 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 it's, it's too risky. You're gonna get contaminated. Don't have those friendships anymore. Don't, don't talk with those people. And I'm going, well, how, how can you impact them then? And, and so we have to live with that risk factor if we're going to seek and save the lost. The mission statement of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is given to us in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And this is what it says. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Would you read those words with me? The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. He sat down with them. He was laughing with them. Just kind of process this with me. As he looked at them, what was in his gaze? Do you think he, he joked with them? Do you think they elbowed him from time to time? I, I just, I, I want you to just imagine the ease with which Christ spent time with these people. And I don't, he didn't play fast and easy with sin, folks. Somehow Jesus was spectacular, so was God, by the way, at separating sin and sinner. I know what you've done, I know where you slept, I know where you've been, but I'm not going to condemn you for that. We're going to just kind of put that on hold for right now, and we're going to focus on what you could become under the transforming power of God. And see if he can't undo all that and remake you. We had a man here last hour. I won't tell you too much except for that God is totally remaking this guy's life. And it is a thrill to be a part of that. Totally. Jesus just seemed to be in his element with people that were far from God. He would take criticism for it. It was okay. He was going to be on mission anyways. These people were made in the image of God and God was going after him. Remember that song? Just There's no wall I won't kick down. Coming after you. That's Jesus. Man. Give me a wall. Give me a mountain. Give me a river. Watch out. I'm coming after you. Because Jesus just aggressively pursues us. And I remember somebody said this to me. I've said it a bunch of times. You better lean on Jesus or he's going to lean on you. When he's pursuing you, it can be rather uncomfortable. Have you ever discovered that? If you haven't, lean on them, Jesus. Okay, all right. All right, we covered that. All right, so when Jesus has this party, he's obviously setting himself up for serious objection, and that's what happens in verses 30 and 32. But let me just ask a question, and I'm going to walk over here one more time. This is the last time ever I'm going over here. Okay. Who needs a doctor? The sick or the well? Who needs a doctor? No, I know how you guys are. You're, you're nice. So you just set up an appointment with your doctor and say, no, no, everything's fine. I just missed you so much. And I just wanted to talk with you today. I paid $70 copay because you're just a really swell person. Now the sick go to doctors, right? So we see in verse 30, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect, complain to his disciples circuitously. They don't even talk to him in his face. They try to go after him through some immature new disciples, right? 
Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them. He had to send a message back through his disciples. He answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I can imagine Jesus actually saying this at the table, and then the disciples reported it. So even the people he was spending time with heard what he said. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And then he says, real simple, he says, I have come to call, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. People turn back to God. Everything can change. I mean, last week, you might remember the religious sin police was out in force, and so there were a whole lot of these people. They immediately jumped on Jesus and tried to intimidate him and shut down his new radical inclusiveness. And he said, I will not be intimidated, and I will not go off mission. I came to seek and to save what was lost. You can kill me for it. That's why I came. And he never went off that mission. That you always see Jesus doing that. And the crazy thing is that the Pharisees, I mean, well, let me just tell you a little secret. If you and I choose to adopt a lifestyle where we build bridges into the lives of people that, that don't know God, we will be misunderstood and criticized by religious people that think we run too high a risk and we're going to contaminate ourselves and compromise. It's going to happen. Expect it to happen. It's a part of the price. And again, we need to understand that when you play with fire, sometimes you get burned. So that the equation is to abide in a growing relation with Christ and then risk towards seeking and saving the lost. You do both. But the crazy thing is that the Pharisees obviously saw themselves as righteous and healthy and therefore in, not, in no need of Christ. And in their self-complacency, they failed to realize they completely missed the heart of God and they too were sick if we adopt a lifestyle and put the title Christian over it and have no intention to actually be salt and light towards people that are far from God, you need a doctor. That's not a healthy condition. Let me give you one last principle this morning. You can't solve a problem until you recognize you have one. And these Pharisees and these religious leaders they thought they were doing right by hating people that were far from God and blocking their road whenever they tried to get near. They thought they were doing God a favor. They completely missed the point about what God is like. And they were sick to the core. And many of them died that way. How could Jesus maintain such an open, accepting, loving, bridge-building attitude toward notorious sinners? Didn't he know that such behavior was beneath him? They were locked into a religious position, the leaders in those days. <coughs> they didn't even recognize that their unwillingness to associate with people far from God was proof that they were sick. I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying, guys. Jesus did not play fast and easy with sin. Sometimes people think, well, you know, if you're going to reach alcoholics, go get drunk in a bar with them. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. Jesus said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. Repentance just means to turn around. To just turn around. So Jesus is not playing fast and easy with sin, but he still made himself approachable and safe. He risked so much to bring people back to God. You see, the only way to salvation with God is through repentance of sin, which leads to a changed heart. But the only way that's going to happen is if somebody goes and somebody shares. We're here to make disciples. That's what Jesus said. That means evangelism and discipleship. You've got to win them before you grow them up. You've got to win them. By the way, you know this, right? We're, gonna, we're, we're in the process of launching a new worship service at the 930 hour, Lord willing, in the fall, via video venue. We're going to renovate that chapel, make it a real contemporary, safe place. That's why the, Luke chapter 5 is why we're doing that. We're going to try to create an environment, you know, where the, the sermon is projected through video because when the pastor is not present, it's less scary because apparently I'm a very scary guy. Live worship over there, but it's going to be a Starbucks environment and coffee and snacks and the lighting's going to be different, very family friendly. And uh, our, our hope is, this is an experiment we're conducting, that people that are currently far from God will feel more at home and safer to experiment with Jesus through an environment like that than they might be coming into a worship auditorium that's big like this with this pastor that's scary like me, okay? <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> but the point is, and it remains as you walk away from this text, that the only 
way people will ever even be exposed to the hope of salvation or a future with God is if people like you and I risk a little bit to, bridge, build, build bridges of, to build bridges of acceptance, to build bridges of concern, build bridges of listening, to build bridges where we just let life flow across those bridges as well as the grace of God. No gimmicks, it's just life on life. Hell and heaven are very real, people. This is very urgent. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. God only has one boy, and his boy is a missionary. And in that same spirit, Jesus says, I'm sending you. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. You want to be like Jesus? You need to know that it's God's call on your life to seek and to save the lost. Figure out, based on your personality experiences, how to best do that. And we try to help you as a church, but how are you doing with that? How are you doing as you think about hanging out with those who need God? Do you have that in your life? And as we walk away from this text, if you don't, please don't blow this off. Invite the Spirit to investigate your life and to show you where you could make some adjustments so you actually live a lifestyle that's based on the mission that God has given you. Okay? Because our goal isn't to try to make people feel guilty in church. Our goal is to help people align their lives with God through church. Enough said. We're going to call our ushers forward right now, as well as our worship team. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. By the way, this is an incredibly generous church. Another $3,000 was given last week for video venues. We're down to about 220 to reach our goal, and it's just thrilling. We're sending out 70-plus people to take the gospel out. What a great week. Moving into Easter, this is our holiday, folks. Father, I just want to thank you this morning for all that you're doing. And Lord, I want to thank you that you're this kind of God that doesn't disqualify us because of our past. You cover our past with the blood of your Son so that we can have a great future with you. And I want to ask, Lord, that the spirit of Levi slash Matthew that we see hanging out with people who need God, the spirit of Jesus who did that would fall upon us and that we would be hungry for that. And once we get a taste from that, we would never turn back. God, continue to work in us, even if it's through uncomfortable moments, so that we actually become like your son and let your son live, live his life through us by your spirit, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.